गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन थैंक यू फॉर ज्वाइनिंग द फ्रिक्वेंट सेमिनार सीरीज ऑर्गेनाइज बाय आई हब क्वांटम टेक्नोलॉजी फाउंडेशन एंड होस्टेड बाय आई सब पुणे वी कम अप विद इंटरेस्टिंग टॉपिक्स एवरी वीक इन द फील्ड ऑफ क्वांटम टेक्नोलॉजीज बिफोर स्टार्टिंग द सेमिनार आई वुड लाइक टू अनाउंस दैट आई हब क्वांटम टेक्नोलॉजी फाउंडेशन इज ऑर्गेनाइजिंग अ डिजाइन थिंकिंग वर्कशॉप इन सेकेंड वीकेंड ऑफ नवम्बर so for that i would like to invite all of you to the workshop as it will demonstrate the significance of prototyping and will cover the insights of idea to prototyping journey <coughs> apart from this we are also coming up with technological workshops in the latest future additionally we are providing fellowship for graduates post graduates doctoral and post doctorals under the chanakya fellowship program For additional information, you can visit our website that is contact dot org dot in. Um, now I would like to invite Dr. Sri Jit to give a brief introduction of uh, Professor Karthik Raman. He is going to take the session ahead. Yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to this Friday Quantum Seminar, which is on Thursday today. Um, um, uh, Oh yeah, and uh, today we have a, uh, um, a speaker from TFI Hyderabad. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Karthik here. He uh, Karthik uh, did his PhD at uh, MIT with uh, uh, Dr. Jagdish Mudera um, uh, in 2011, and uh, uh, after that he worked at IBM for a brief period, and uh, since 2013. Uh, he has been at TIFR Hyderabad, and he is an expert at material synthesis, spintronics, um, organic uh, semiconductors, and various uh, topics that are of interest to the quantum technology hub here. So it was it is great to have uh, Karthik here give a seminar on uh, some of his recent work in this direction. Thanks, Rijit. So it's just a follow up. It was a pleasure to be here, and uh, my real thanks to Richard and all the other members of I Hub to invite me here to give this talk. Uh, so what you see here is essentially a campus or a building of TFI Hyderabad, uh, uh, which is right now uh, in its expansion mode. We are planning to kind of expand in terms of our activities over the next few years. So it's, it's almost close to around uh, 200 acres campus that we have, and this is right now the first building where almost all of our experimental uh, facilities. Uh, in all these streams of physics, chemistry, and biology are, are are placed. So let me start off by saying that I'm going to give a perspective of magnetic proximity effect today, uh, covering topics from modular spin interface studies to topological oscillators. And only a couple of days ago, I actually realized that I'm giving a talk at the High Hub. So I've I've changed my talk a bit. I'm not really going deep into uh, uh, the technical aspects of the work, but giving you a perspective of. Kind of relating to the IHUB technology uh, initiatives and uh, and how our research program is kind of related to uh, so such activities. So I, my talk outline is essentially going to talk about the objective of a research program. I'm going to tell you about you know how you know, instrumentation of technology development is actually goes hand in hand with the kind of science that we have to do, especially when you want to do any cutting edge science. These two really plays an important role, and that's one of the things that we have placed uh, importance in our group from the very beginning. And I'll talk about specifically about uh, the, the theme of my work, uh, proximity effect, covering multiple spin interface and proximity effects. And then I'll talk about some of our future research directions. Of course, not going into detail, but we have results. But I'm not going to discuss this here. And then lastly, about some of the in-house technology developments that we have been working on. Okay. <coughs> so when you talk about the silicon technology, we we know that you know, we have started from a very large, you know, uh, uh, field effect transistor-based devices, starting from almost devices that were millimeter long. And now we have really scaled down to dimensions of what is called fine nanometer technology node that IBM and Intel are working on, uh, and all this is happening at the cost of going from three-dimensional materials down to almost one-dimensional, zero-dimensional materials. And in the process, you know, in the process, this has driven the technology forward. And the reason we have our smartphones, laptops working so efficiently is because of the technology that goes into it. And now we are, as I said, talking about a different revolution, talking about quantum revolution, where again we start off materials. We should, we should label them as quantum materials. Basically, it means that there is some particular characteristic properties of these materials that shows quantum-like signatures. But these are again three-dimensional materials in bulk crystals, and 
we are trying to work at developing quantum technologies of the future that can really scale up our, our, our uh, activities uh, in terms of uh, uh, information processing, in terms of uh, device uh, uh, capabilities. So the thing that is common between all the, between these two technologies is essentially primarily two things, if I go into detail. One is, sorry, one is generally a thin film technology. You know? Any of the things that you see in silicon fabrication or even how quantum devices will eventually evolve is to be able to grow them as thin films and not as bulk materials. Because that's where the beauty lies in terms of designing devices in thin films, engineering its properties, and then building schemes to be able to do those uh, quantum computing or you know, different uh, concepts. And second, obviously, is the ability to be able to fabricate them to our desire to, divide, to essentially build those schemes uh, which will enable us to work towards this technology. So our group primarily works in this area of spintronics and quantum devices uh, physics. Um, so the objective from the very beginning is to be able to look at building device schemes using different classes of materials. For example, you know, magnetic systems like magnetic insulators, you have semiconductors, which could be high mobility semiconductors, or you could have a superconductor interface. And we're talking about thin films of these materials, which are typically of the order of maybe few five to six nanometers to all the way around 10 to 20 nanometers. That's the typical range of individual layers we're talking about. To be able to precisely grow these films at those thicknesses and interface, have a very clean interface, is, is challenging. And to be able to do this, you, be, you need to be able to work at extremely pure conditions, which is ultra high vacuum. So we're talking about below 10 to minus 9 millibar. So just to give you a concept, uh, understanding of what is the vacuum level you're talking about, at these pressures, typically it takes close maybe 15 to 20 minutes or even close to half an hour to form a single layer of oxygen on your sample once it's in vacuum. And if you work at a minus 10 millibar, you kind of take almost a day to form one layer of oxygen. And the reason I'm saying oxygen is specifically or moisture is because when you talk about spin devices, we talk about being able to build devices based on spin properties of the electron, you need to be extremely clean on your surfaces because any local absorption sites can actually completely modify the spin densities. And that is not helpful in terms of being able to build your devices with good yield. So the challenge is therefore to be able to be work, you will make these structures under such clean atmospheres. <coughs> that has been the goal of our lab from the way we started. So this is kind of a picture of a lab where we have been assembling systems from the day one. Most of these are, again, not some, it is not commercially bought systems, many of them are components. We buy them and we assemble them, manufacture few things in-house and few things are made uh, in, in certain facilities in India. And we assemble them together. So what you see here is a cluster ultra high vacuum system. All these individual changes, including all the way from here, are all connected and without breaking vacuum, you can actually move samples from one place to other place. For example, if you are uh, growing a certain specific material, which can be grown only by certain pin film deposition technique, then you need to, uh, have a dedicated chamber for those. So this is primarily uh, uh, our workhorse. So just to uh, understand how we typically do our research, so there is a small load lock here. This is open almost on a daily basis. You load your samples onto which you want to coat your films, substrates which we call. They're loaded, they put in this load lock, and then you wait for a couple of hours to pump out vacuum, and pump out air and create vacuum. And then you can move the sample, say to MB1, you are forming some layer of A, that you want to grow. And then sometimes you might want to go to a sputtering, which is a different kind of technique to be able to grow films. You can grow layer B, and same process can be repeated multiple times depending on the device scheme. You could then even move the sample all the way from here through this trolley line to the STM. This is a scanning culling microscope to be able to look at atomic, atomic resolution, how does the surface electronic states get modified <coughs> because of this interfacing. And all these things can be done in the presence of magnetic fields, what are the pain plane. So it gives us interesting problems to look at in terms of exotic uh, spin correlated systems, how they perform locally and spatially in terms of uh, its uh, differential conductance, spectroscopy, or, or any analysis that you want to look at interfaces. So there's a QR code, so you could add uh, a small YouTube video about how this function, which if you are interested, you can just scan and have it. Okay, or we can even grow up such patterns, uh, films, take it out, you can do a, uh, can make a device structure pattern them using typical uh, clean room procedures. 
and uh, then do your measurements down to low temperatures or whatever you want to do. So this didn't start just, we actually started from the point we occupied the building. So this is something, you know, uh, when we joined, I was one of the first experimentalists to join this place and even the civil engineer was new, so he refused to kind of, kind of build the facility that we're looking at simply because many of the things had to be put on vibration isolation foundation. So we, so this is something where I learned, learned civil engineering myself. I was there at midnight to be able to, when this concrete was poured, and this is how what we started, and uh, and finally we essentially have the system up, functional, and working well. So this is again one of the attachments of scanning clean microscope. This again, I would say, it's it's this kind of world's first integrated cryogen-free, complete cryogen-free system, which operates down to around 12 Kelvin. So you could essentially load a sample here, move it to the STM, and uh, you can get atomic resolutions. Uh, in field, so this is with a magnet, which is again a cryogen free magnet. So this is all kind of the design of the frame, everything we took care of and reported in this review of, uh, of scientific instruments. So anyone interested can actually have it. <coughs> Doesn't that coordinate affect your resolution of this? <coughs> so that's where the design comes in the picture. For example, uh, this cold head here is an ARS cold head. It is it is decoupled using a rubber bellow, and there is a small volume of liquid helium that gets filled up and this liquid helium then de is basically decouples and so cools on your cryostatic. This is mechanically isolated, uh, therefore vibrations don't reach the STM. And there, is, there are spring suspensions inside which has a certain resonant frequency to take care of. Uh, you detune it and then that is how the spring designs are made which makes sure your STM is functional. You uh, don't have any running turbos or We have, so that's, that's where the beauty of our system is that Typically, in any world, you, any place you go in the world where they have STM, you typically go your samples in a connected chamber with a turbo pump, grow it, you turn up a turbo pump, move your sample to the STM, and do pipe measurements. But here, we don't have to do anything. The systems are far away. You can, students can keep growing samples there for other projects. Here, you could actually do sensitive measurement. That's what we do, and it works perfectly. So and then your transferring happens uh, manually. Manually, yeah, manually. This is manual. We can automate this, but. It's uh, too much effort. Uh, no, it is a mechanical, it's a rack and pinion setup. Okay. This is basically called a radial trans distribution chamber. You can, it's, a, it's an arm, you can rotate inside as you design. And it can extend out through a locking mechanism outward. And then there's a wobble stick here which can pick up the sample, bring it back. And then there's another manipulator which can pick up the sample and move it inside this thing. <coughs> this whole thing is actually sitting on a 50 tons of concrete. So if you see here the structure, this is where the STM is actually. This is a so this view is exactly this view. This is where the 50 tons of concrete is there, which is sitting on sand, and is decoupled from the building foundation. What's the resonance frequency? less than 1.5 hertz. Okay. So uh, this is, and if you can actually even lift this 50 ton concrete with an airbag spring, but we haven't no, installed it yet. Yeah, we haven't done that. It's not required because the system is performing perfectly. Okay. So, uh, so yeah. So if you look at kind of cluster system is this pretty primitive. I mean, I would say one of the kinds in India, but it's primitive because if you look at some of the major facilities who are working on quantum material device technologies, for example, IQC, and we give you a photo of the system. This is an actual cluster system that is helpful to be able to look at the same problems that we are dealing with. Uh, and there are very handful of uh, labs uh, where, you know, such facilities exist that can really interface spin physics with supernatural physics and also look at semi Therefore, this is where we are right now. It's probably the only place in KFA where we are having this capability. But how many sources you have in the MB? In the MB, we have close to around uh, the MB one has close to around uh, five Egan pockets and uh, three K cells. The new MB that we have designed right now is having close to around six uh, K cells. And we can obviously it has a gate file, so we can take it out and we can load a new one. So That's right. contamination problem. No, so. If it's a certain project, it's fine. But since the chambers are very cheap, they are 8 lakhs, it's the components that are expensive. So if you want to start a new project, you just buy a new chamber and use the same components. So it's not a major issue for us. It's only typically the cost is high because of the chamber cost, which in this case is. <coughs> so this is the current status where we are as, as a world in terms of this. And uh, it would be good if more such facilities can come up in India. Um, Okay, so again, th this is the last slide about kind of relating to the iHub activities. Just to give demonstrators, this is the MB system we're talking about. 
this was the first MB that we built. It was close around 5 minus 10 millibar that we could attain. And now we have built a new MB which is up running. This goes to almost base pressure, best base pressure we, we have reached around 5 minus 11 millibar with this, without any material loads. So the other important thing is the capability of our sputtering. This is again a very unique system. We won't find this commercially. It's a turret style, it's basically a turret style system where you have targets on rotating arm. You have four here and four at the back, so eight targets which can be rotated pointing towards the sample with a local gas injection. So argon gas can be locally injected to the source and you can sputter. And this is an example of a sputtering that happens between manganese and platinum. And uh, it's again UHV class. Okay, so this took us probably around 50 lakhs, 60 lakhs to make, but if you buy it this commercially, you'll probably half a million. So that's the kind of levels we're talking about in terms. And I'll show at the end some of the sample qualities that we have grown with these two techniques, which are really uh, top class. <coughs> so what is the challenge here in terms of uh, the device, in terms of the physics of what uh, research we are trying to do? Now, when you talk about compounds, let's say chalcogenic compounds, uh, you would like to grow certain classes of materials, let's say bismuth televite. Okay. So you always need to first start looking at the phase diagram of these materials as a, as a growth expert. Uh, you have to look at the phase diagram understand what all the phases are actually forming and you would like to tune your ratio of tellurium bismuth to the right phase. And that is one of the things that we control here in our MBE by controlling the flux of individual atoms of bismuth and tellurium that is pointing towards your sample towards the substrate. And the quality of the films can be probed in situ using what is called reflective high energy electron diffraction technique which I will discuss briefly uh, once we come to the results. So the main challenges is in terms of illustrometry having a good crystal structure growth of the films, understand strains that can be created in the frames, film because of the lattice matching the substrate. Uh, again, looking at device pattern and interface point. So <coughs> let's come to some of the research programs that we have been working on. So I'll start off with molecular spin interface where in this case, the main criteria is to be able to grow ferromagnets without any contamination of the surface because Iron, like for example, you're working with iron, you can work at the samples as well. But you need to make sure that the iron surface is extremely pure, and then you interface it with the molecules to be able to understand the role of interaction of these molecules on these magnetic surfaces. So, so yes, so this is primarily where I'll cover two specific topics. One is interaction molecule on a ferromagnet, and secondly, about what does a magnetic insulator do to the surface of a topological insulator, uh, or the inverse which is called inverse magnetic proximity effect, leading to some interesting spin texture physics that I'll cover about. Okay, so let's give, give you the objective or the, or the motivation of, of the work that we're trying to do. Now, before 2010, 20, uh, uh, 2009, people used to believe that the molecules, most of the molecules generally, they physics up on a surface, and the interaction is primarily driven by Van der Waals interaction, or slightly uh, stronger in terms of charge transfer leading to renormalization of a molecular orbital levels. But things change, this is what typically happens. You have a molecule which absorbs, the molecular states just broaden because of some renormalization with the metallic bands, but they still retain this discrete like energy levels. But things change drastically, especially when there is a strong interaction which is called chemistry option, where if you have aromatic molecule, for example, which has its phi levels, uh, which are again discrete energy levels, but when they are put on a surface of ferromagnet where you have these D bands that are spin split, which is what why, why they have magnetism. In these cases, you lead to hybridization. That means you're basically talking about for hybridization of these pi states with localized pi states with these D bands, leading to somewhat like a band, uh, bonding and bonding chemistry that happens, leading to new interface states that look very different to your primitive molecule or your surface. And that is what we are trying to understand, capture in terms of these interface states. What is the property of interface states? Whether one could tune them, whether we could get interesting physics coming out of, of these uh, interface states. So, <coughs> so what can happen? I mean, uh, so there are many things that can happen. Uh, first of all, you could, uh, you know, uh, you could actually induce magnetism in the molecule. What does that mean? That basically means that when you have interaction, you create interface states which are projected on the molecule and the molecule now has a net moment because of its interaction with the ferromagnet. How do you see this? 
people have seen this using spin polarized STM, where your tip is magnetic, you scan on a surface, therefore you can get spin contrast of the surface. And what they observe is that experimentally they see spin contrast that appears on the molecule, which is probed by a theory using density functional calculations. And they actually see a perfect matching at different voltage ranges, energy levels, one to one correspondence, indicating that indeed this can only happen if there is a strong hybridization leading to chemisorption and the intra typical interactions are not no longer three angstroms but much below the van der Waals radius, which is typically one to around 1.8 to 2.2 angstroms, and indicating the strong interaction. You could also, you know, <coughs> engineer your molecular structure such that you can observe what is called a spin filtering effect, where the interactions can propagate to second molecule, in which case you can have injection of electrons which is spin dependent. One spin is injected efficiently over the other spin, which is what is a concept of spin filtering that is described here. And this essentially gives rise to very interesting transport signatures like the interface non effect that we have proved a long time back. This is one of the other uh, advantage or uh, possibilities that people have demonstrated. You could also see this is something in the review article I had proposed, which is that uh, which was later shown in this in this structure where you have copper C60 molecule uh, interface structure. When the copper is thin, you can uh, see that this interface phase can actually induce magnetism in copper. So now in this case, the copper can become weakly magnetic. And why is this happening is primarily because of the stoner's band theory parameter, which basically says that if you are able to change the band structure, you can actually stabilize the band structure to have a spin splitting which can lower its energy and therefore you can induce magnetism at the interface in the copper material. So these are some of the very interesting exotic features that molecule can actually do to your system. It really changes the magnetic uh, signatures uh, at the interface. Is that hysteresis curve or something? No, this is starting from zero, then goes, then is symmetric only. It looks little hysteresis, but it's not. So that's a good point. You will see next uh, our, our data where we see this shift. I have a question. Yes. Uh, so in the top uh, panel, where you show the uh, molecule, molecular magnetism, they probe by a scan. Is the tip? I mean, for to do such experiments, the tip should be few atom. Uh, yes. So this is typically done by by coating fresh iron on a tungsten tip, or take a chromium tip, which is magnetic. And typically, the tip spin state is frozen. It needs very high field to switch. So the spin state of the tip is frozen. So now when you do a measurement in some positive field, small positive field, which only changes the sample magnetization, but not the tip magnetization, you get some electron density of states. Then you do a measurement in a downward field, do the same measurement, the same voltage. This difference of this spin electron density of states is what is shown here, which is the spin contrast. So it again. My question is the physical size of the tip. Physical size of the tip. Ideally, it is <coughs> it's an apex with a single or a couple of atoms at the tip. And since it's a tunneling effect, so the smaller, lowest atom dominates your uh, device response. Okay. And the other effect, which was shown by many people, including us, way back, was the effect of surface magnetic hardening. That means when you put the molecules, this is a typical magnetization versus field curve. So this say is your reference ion, which is having some specific switching field. Once you put a specific molecule, in this case is a PCP molecule, this is a theory work. It was shown that you can enhance the cohesivity of our switching field of this ion and PCP system by almost double it in this case. And then people have seen 10 times or even, you know, many times, many fold increase in the cohesivity because of such interactions experimentally and theoretically. So this is something interesting again that the molecule actually induces some kind of spin orbit like in effects at the interface, enhancing the cohesivity of the ion as long as they are thin. You make them thick in the bulk dominates, but if the ion film is thin enough, you can actually induce uh, such effects in the system. And there have been a number of reports on this. So effect. this is independent of how the molecule is oriented? Uh, experimentally, ex yeah, so experimentally, always molecule when it sits, it, it, it has always in, enough energy to stabilize in the lower minimum configuration. In theory, they look at different configurations, DFT, see the energy, and then typically they look at 
the structure that is local, it gives it minimum energy. There, the elephant man structure is calculated and gives you information about the spin orbit effects and the mandu crystalline entropy that can be determined from the API. Yes. <coughs> so, this we started off this project uh, to understand primarily with a standard molecule which doesn't really contaminate their bees over it. So, that way, this is a clean system and it's a molecules molecule, has a good wind pressure. So, uh, so, we decided to look at iron because iron is, is a relatively clean surface compared to cobalt or other uh, uh, nickel, especially, relatively speaking. So, so, we looked at growing samples in a specific way in our MBA system. So, we have uh, iron which is grown on silicon oxide, some nanometers, uh, which you can control. And then we have an in-situ shadow mass, we can cover one part of the sample and grow the molecule on the other. So this becomes our control sample in some sense, which has only iron. And in the case, we have iron molecule structure, which is uh, uh, grown simultaneously to make sure the growth rate, thickness, everything is changed. There's no really artifacts because of multiple growth thickness. So now what we observe here is the same thing. that. This is basically a chart of the switching field, the cohesivity at the point at which field at which the ferromagnet switches of iron is what is shown here on the y-axis and this is the temperature curve. Now as you cool down, generally the Mandelkrystalline entropy of the metal enhances, so cohesivity increases. And that is what you see here. It increases, increases, increases. In the case of reference, it increases there but you can't see the scale. It's a very gradual increase for a control sample, which is a reference sign. But in the case of molecule, you see a drastic enhancement as you go down temperature. In all these cases, we have ch checked two molecules, cobalt PC and manganese PC. In both cases, there is a switch enhancement in the cohesivity. But at some point, if you see here, ideally, you expected it to go further up, indicating surface hardening is still present in the system. But what you observe is just complete flatness. Well, it no longer increases and it kind of saturates. <coughs> so to understand this effect, I am just giving you a concept of exchange bias effect. What is the exchange bias effect? Generally, this is if you take a ferromagnet and you measure its magnetization with this field, it looks something like a square like response, which is centered around the zero field. But now, if you interface this ferromagnet with an antiferromagnet, and if the antiferromagnet is above its kneel temperature, that means the spin is not ordered really antiferromagnetic but really random, then it system looks exactly the same as here. But as you cool down below its kneel temperature, you kind of, at the interface, induce a specific exchange spinning that shifts this hysteresis from the center to one side. And this is called the exchange bias effect. And this is relevance. This relevance is very important. The reason hard disk drive technology has evolved is because of this specific phenomena that is used in your read ahead drives to be able to read information in hard disk drives. So therefore, it's a very crucial technological component. <coughs> but typically, as you thin down antiferromagnet, you typically lose this exchange bias because the antiferromagnet is no longer stable and therefore there is a critical thickness below of antiferromagnet below which you don't see this effect. But interestingly, what we see here is that when you grow a monolayer of this molecule on the surface of iron, you can actually observe this shift, which I'm not showing it here, but this is the data extracted from all those measurements, showing that you have a shift in this hysteresis leading to and increase below certain temperatures like 30 Kelvin for MNPC and for 50 Kelvin for the case of cobalt PC. <coughs> and so when there is exchange by shift, you see this flattening of the response. And this is interesting because now we have been able to create a pseudo two-dimensional antiferromagnetic layer, a single monolayer of molecule that is able to create exchange bias phenomena. How is it doing it? So what is essentially happening is we call this as a molecular crane pulley effect where the molecule essentially interacts with the surface ion, it changes, it makes the surface hard enough that energetically the bottom ion layer is able to switch independently compared to the surface. Okay. And, and it is this relative exchange bias motion which is essentially leading to the observation of exchange bias effect. So this is... So cutting in its bulk from COPC and MLPC are They are not antiferromagnetic. They are not magnetic. They are not magnetic at all. <coughs> Cobalt PC has a small moment, uh, but uh, but they are much lower, they are like below one point, well, below 9 Kelvin, 8 Kelvin, something of that range. Okay. And we are talking of single monolayer, so we are not talking about any molecular molecular interactions appearing at all. And the monolayer is generally confirmed with our STM, I am not showing data here, but yeah, the monolayer coverage, the flux is all controlled using STM. 
So we are moving on. We are actually now looking at uh, how what does molecule do in terms of what is called. Okay, I forgot to put this skirmion texture, but uh, in terms of skirmion physics, so skirmion physics will come later, but it's basically a specific spin texture of the spins in a material is having a certain chirality. And these are stabilized <coughs> in the bulk systems, but in our case, we are working with the chromium telluride films. This is an unpublished, it's just recently ongoing work, I just have one slide on it. We're trying to look at how does the molecular absorption, like VOPC in this case, stabilizes this skirmion phase of this specific material. So if you see here, the range is less the, in terms of the skirmion signature, I would say this is skirmion signature with uh, in the system. Uh, this signature becomes enhanced as you can see here from this color plot as you increase, as you put the molecule on top. So this is an additional parameter which we have recently looking at and exploring more of it. But I just put this slide just to highlight that molecules can actually be used to even control certain exotic magnetic phases. So, 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 yeah. So, what does this color plot show? Yes, sorry. So, I didn't, I, I forgot to label. I was, I was busy today. I forgot to label it. I forgot about it. So, this is the magnetic field, and this is a temperature scan, and this is a signature of the hall, topological hall signal, okay, <coughs> which is an indicator of this skirmion texture. Okay, so this is gets stabilized. Uh, so, as you can see here, for the same range, it gets enhanced. So your molecular absorption is what, locally changing the PMI? Yes, so it is locally changing. We are talking about 4.5 nanometer thin films. So it's locally changing the ID of individual EMI, which is getting enhanced and dominating your uh, spin technique physics. So which is probe experimental. Yes. <coughs> how does it do it here? So, uh, so it's again, so typically a, a simple way to explain this is that when a molecule interacts with the, with the so this is, generally two-dimensional growth. You, we have read to show us exactly two-dimensional growth. When you put a molecule, typically the molecule forces chemistry and breaks the symmetry even further at the interface because of this interaction. And this symmetry breaking can actually contribute because chromium teller is anyway the high spin orbit system. So with the inversion symmetry breaking at the interface stronger than a clean surface, <coughs> promote, <coughs> promotes a stronger IDMI term, uh, interfacial and dimensional more interaction term leading to this thing to this appearing system. So when you have the species sitting on your magnetic lattice, uh, so does that structurally distort locally? Can you get a The DFT, it will show it distorts. That is shown by many people. Okay. In terms of skirmion, it's a challenging problem. Mokil okay. okay. knows about it. Probing and from DFT to be, to be able to extract the individual DMI parameters, the direction of it, and then doing uh, fluid calculation or micromagnetic simulations to be able to understand how does it evolve with field is the very few selected groups in the world who, who can again. When you say spin texture in this system, yes. in, the, in the material below your molecules or what? Yes, it, so the interfacial DMI induces spin texture is in this 4.0 film totally in the bulk itself. I mean, not bulk, but I think. What kind of texture? So that I will show this. I, unfortunately, I, I this slide I forgot to put that spin texture, but it's coming in some other con context. Okay, so I'll move on to the next topic. So this is primarily one of the things that we have been uh, working on. The other project is on understanding the interface between what is called topological insulator and a magnetic insulator. The concepts may be new to some. I'll just, without going into very much details into the concepts of topological band theory that few of you will understand. But I'm just telling you here, when you have topological insulator, it basically means that the bulk is generally insulating or semiconducting, it has some band gap, but at the surface, of this film, you have a Dirac cone graphene like system. You have Dirac cone with a Dirac point. Further, compared to graphene, graphene in this case, you have an electron spin momentum locking, which is captured by this Hamiltonian k dot c uh, dot uh, sigma polymer. <coughs> and therefore, the spin momentum locking is something unique to this topological insulators at the surface. So, what? So, just to give what, what do you mean? So, in the bulk of this, you have band gap, so you will have some semiconducting like property which is diffusive in nature and this is captured in terms of how the electrons randomly move around the system. But at the surface, because the spin and momentum is locked, you essentially have dealing with spin electrons which are having, um, propagating highways. One spin up goes this way, spin down has to go this way because that's how spin texture forces. If the electron has a momentum in this direction, it can only have this spin. At the back of it is a other way around can only have the downspin. 
so this is kind of a simple representation for today's talk in terms of having swing electrons at high risk, which can be highly conducting. And therefore, most of the mobility and the transport can happen through the surface states, provided your Fermi level is close to this Dirac point or this uh, level. That is the most crucial part. How do you probe them? You can probe them by the concept of weak anti-localization or weak localization signals, which essentially means you should see a cusp-like signature in your conductance, mandro conductance response. Okay. Typically, you see weak anti-localization. But when you have a <coughs> magnetic insulator on top like this, what it does is that if you have a magnetic insulator which has the outer plane anisotropy, this magnetization is out of the plane. Uh, in this case, essentially, you will induce a specific exchange term in your Hamiltonian. And this exchange term will cause a gap opening at the Dirac point. And this gap opening will introduce interesting features of quantum anomalous Hall effect. I'm not going into detail of this, but it gives interest in topological physics aspects to the system. So this is primarily the reason people have been driving this field in terms of understanding <coughs> what happened in this, in this material. <coughs> so we started off with this project with some earlier reports, uh, uh, which is essentially looking at certain configuration business cell night with a Heisenberg ferromagnet, which is European sulfide. So European sulfide is interesting, which, which only selected groups in the world actually have access to it in terms of how to grow this. So the, the thing is here, this European sulfide is a Heisenberg ferromagnet, the TCF 16 Kelvin. And they were reports using micrometry, polarized neutron micrometry, and, and uh, squid measurements that demonstrated that you could actually induce magnetism at, in the US even above its Curie temperature to all the way up to around, uh, around room temperature. In which case, you have outer plane canting of the spins in the interfacial US. But as you cool down, <coughs> the bulk US picks up, which likes to be aligned in plane. So in some sense, you have a spin canted response of the US at the interface. And so primarily done on magnetic techniques. Transport signatures were really not that good in many of these devices. Uh, they didn't, for example, spin momentum blocking was not observed. They didn't observe many other effects. So therefore, the question arises, what is causing it? Now, in these cases, the uranium sulfide was grown at very high temperatures, almost 500, 600, and epitaxial constraint or crystalline constraints were, uh, were kept. But the problem here is that it can actually cause interdiffusion, and therefore, you know, what we felt is that this is perhaps the reason why we are not seeing good electronic signatures. We put on a similar system, but we grow this EUS at room temperature <coughs> in a disordered growth. This is one of the first. Uh, uh, films that we grow in IMB, which can see they can even order on a silicon silicon oxide. We have data on sapphire as well, but this is grown on a silicon silicon oxide substrate. And you can see perfect layer growth of these films in our MB system with an EUS, which is amorphous, as you can see here, uh, on top. And, <coughs> and uh, XRD shows very nice C axis growth of these films. And uh, in situ read, is again a technique which is used to understand how the film grows during the evaporation. So what it does is that typically you have your crystal and you know the concept of reciprocal lattice points. They are points, there's a real space, you have reciprocal lattice points. When you take thin films, one layer, you essentially don't have an atom above it. So you can assume that your reciprocal lattice is actually not a point but it actually becomes infinite broad. Because the next atom very far away, so 2 pi by a becomes essentially infinite. So in that sense, you have a lattice rod formation in this case. And the, the diameter of these rods gives information about the size of your patch, of your grains, of films that you're growing. Okay. So the sharper, the, so, so when you talk about read, an electron gun essentially is hitting at the grazing incidence here and is captured by a fluorescent screen. Now, in diffraction theory, you always look at evolved sphere, how it intersects the reciprocal lattice. So what you have now is a lattice rod, and you have an evolved sphere, and it intersects this specific rod. When it intersects, you can see here, you always find some streaks. And the fineness of the streak gives information about how good your films are. If they're very broad, you know they're, they're, they are very patchy. But they're still two-dimensional. So this is just an overview about what techniques are used in MB to be able to in situ understand the growth of your system. So without going into the detail, so uh, we have been looking at, we have observed, which was not observed earlier before, which is the concept of weak antilocation in these systems we observed for the first time. <coughs> Further, we saw interesting effects 
and when you make these devices and we can gate these devices to look at the resistance of these films, we could see that the, when you have just a bismuth film, you don't see any change with gate voltage. But when you have a US cap device, you have a big variation in the response. And you can see this upturn, which is typically, oh, I won't go into detail here, but, but this upturn keeps changing. And this is a signature of what US is doing to your device. So if I probe this upturn as a function of uh, gate voltage, which is what we did, <coughs> you can see here that as you increase the gate voltage, your upturn, which is shown here for a specific gate voltage of 50 volt, uh, you start seeing an upturn at a higher temperature. That means you are increasing somewhat the effect of EUS by gating. That means by gating, you are essentially injecting more electrons at the interface. And this electron somehow is enhancing the TC of EUS which is shown here electronically for the first time uh, through uh, an uh, conventional electron mediated archegevaric interactions which essentially can enhance the TC of the US. And this is electronic signature. We have more data, but I'm, for the simplicity, I'm just showing one specific data uh, of specific gate voltage where you see this formation of this hysteresis at this point and again around this point. So this is 19 Kelvin, which is the TC of bulk US. And this is the TC of the interfacial US, which is shown here, that is having enhanced data. So this is something work done by uh, a post of Mati and Sataki uh, who graduated. <coughs> okay, so why is this happening? So, so I would say that this is what we have been observed. We have observed what is called this inverse proximity effect. But what has happened? You are primarily looking at what does a magnetic insulator does to the properties of the Dirac cone at the topology insulator. That's how we started. But interesting, what we observed is the inverse proximity effect where the topological insulator is actually inducing interesting properties in the EUS. Firstly, it's enhancing the TC of the interfacial EUS through this conductive electron mediated interactions. which is also uh, demonstrated in theory work using PRL where uh, this EUS can actually induce exchange correlations in the bismuth cell line and enhance the TC. But the other interesting thing that we are observing is, which I'll come into, which is I'm giving a summary slide here, which is that we are able to observe some interesting formation of non collinear spin textures, just to answer my question. Some spin textures, something like this, this is like Sturmian like system here, which can be formed in the system. So, what we are seeing here is that because of this high spin orbit surface with the integration DMI is broken, inversion symmetry is broken at the interface, you can stabilize spin texture physics at the interface. How do you probe them? So, what we do is simple measurement. We just measure the device resistance as the function of field going from outer plane to in plane. Okay. When it's outer plane, you see a standard cusp. As you go in plane, you see an abrupt, sharp change in resistance of a device. Okay. And this device resistance we have probed in both the long-term resistance and even in the hall resistance, which is much abrupt compared to how the magnetization of EUS is changing, which is detected using squaring. Okay. So, the US is changing magnetic gradually, however, in the transport, these signatures are really sharp and abrupt. So, why is this happening? <coughs> so, we try to probe this further. The signature starts appearing only below around 3.5 Kelvin, although we know that US is magnetic much above that temperature, around 16 to 20 Kelvin. So this is interesting that this electronically, we see the signature only below 3.5 Kelvin. And whether the field is in plane parallel to current or perpendicular to current in the plane, the response are very similar here. Okay, so we have done more measurements where we show a spin orbit torque effect, which is basically by increasing current density, you, the signal actually goes down, doesn't increase. So that again is a confirmation that this is nothing to do with spin orbit torque effect. So there's something different that is happening. So we moved on from bismuth selenide system to bismuth telluride system, and you can see that the, the the response is even more exotic. So here, the step response that happens doesn't show any hysteresis. It's, it's essentially there is no gap opening. It's just, it, it goes over one uh, over the other in the forward and backward scans. But when you take bismuth telluride, you see interesting. You see essentially a sick opening up of hysteresis around the switching field of US, <coughs> and you see a hump-like response and a dip-like response uh, in this signature. So this is somewhat interesting. This has not been observed before, and people. And frankly, we have been trying to understand this for the last one and a half years uh, because uh, there are no reports of such kind uh, in experiments. And we know primarily that this is not governed by the surface states effect because the Fermi level in this system is way far away from the rock point in the Puntel right? 
So we know it is conduction from mediated, but what are features is, is occurring is because of the spin texture uh, possibilities in the US. And why we call spin texture is because, yeah. Staying with this much serenade itself, you can vary the Fermi level Yes, we can. We so can you see this similar thing there? Or? Uh, so the thing is, uh, we have tried many samples. This is not this is probably 15, 20 samples right. with, and always there will be some selenium so variation, right. which changes carrier concentration from uh, 10 to power uh, uh, 5 10 to power 13 centimeter square to almost 10 to power 14. All these ranges we have not seen. It's always something like this. As you go to higher higher carry concentration, this goes off. You don't see this effect. <coughs> Why do you think it below 3.5? Yes. So the reason is, so there's this concept in Rio, which is again right now we can only talk about speculation, but this is known, which is that US has an in-plane anisotropy, but because of interfacial effects, you can have a spin reorientation at the interface, which can cause spin canting. And this spin canting can appear much lower temperatures, which is, a, which is understandable in these systems. It's just to show this, we need theory support, and that is complicated because EUS is a 4x system. Thickness, right? huh? working with three nanometers. Yeah. Yeah, so now we are, we are doing this study as a function of different thickness of EUS. That's an ongoing work. But since these are slow experiments, and the, yeah, the time on the instrument is a little bit for us tight. <coughs> so yeah, so this is something that we observe. And we see more of this in different devices. But again, we see very interesting features. I'm not going into detail of this. This is a Burles and Metalla uh, here. And this is all done using linear hull measurement technique. So observing this response is something different because, for example, as a report recently last year in our letters, uh, bismuth selenide and the BFO. The BFO is a perpendicular anisotropy material, it doesn't have anisotropy. In this case, you observe this kink and hub, which is typical signature topological effect in an outer plane anisotropy. It's not in plane. In our experiments, all these measurements and this hump and dip are all observed in plane. So, what can give rise to this in plane spin textures is an uh, interesting concept because there are theoretical work in terms of demonstration of skirmions, anti skirmions, and merons which can give rise to these signatures, but practically, experimentally, there is no evidence of this. And we are really studying for the last one year, but we are trying to get some proof, some theory. Uh, what's the typical size of your whole device? Typical sizes are of the order of 150 microns, <coughs> channel limit. And length could be of the order of few mm, no, one, 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 two mm. So these are mechanically strapped under a microscope by hand. The reason is we have tried clean room also, but in I mean, lithography as well, but the mobility is degraded. And once the mobility degrades, the bulk, so, so this is a, essentially a two-channel model. You have surface states that are highly conducting, and you need more current to flow in the surface states to probe these interfacial spins. So, so there are those reasons. OK. <coughs> yes, so, so now I'm, of course, we are doing lots of other uh, areas as well. But I'm just, since I'm here at the IHUB, and uh, I was generously funded for one post of fellowship, so Sataki graduated, and then because of his two-body problem, he's still here with me, thankfully. So he is really good, really good in terms of doing nice experiments, measurements, uh, growth, and I will something show you. So he is really continuous on fellowship here, and uh, uh, we are working on a specific system, which is a wild high metal system. And the reason it is interesting is because again, it has very interesting concepts borrowed from high energy physics, which can be showed in condensed matter systems. I'll just give a motivation, and there are lots to learn from it. So, so generally, in a Dirac, in a graphene, you have one Dirac cone, you have one Dirac point. But you have in systems where you basically uh, break either immersion symmetry or time reversal symmetry. You can actually break these white Dirac cones are in these materials are degenerate. You can break one of the symmetries, and you can have them split in momentum space. So you have one Dirac cone is called wild nodes now, wild node of one chirality here and while node of opposite chirality at the other place in momentum, separate momentum, <coughs> which is captured by this Hamiltonian. And this Hamiltonian, if you look at full glory, can be very interesting to understand many effects like you know, Hawking's radiation, uh, gravitational lensing. So they, they're all borrowed from the same Hamilton picture. And this somewhat excites us because condensed matter systems that can be able to 
get this full glory Hamiltonian is not yet demonstrated. So we're working at <coughs> SpaceX is non free and different magnets. So I'm not going again to deal because of time. I'm almost uh, out of time. So we are working on this Kagawa material structures, uh, which is again very interesting because they are frustrated systems. They don't know how to align uh, with triangular geometry. They are strongly correlated therefore. You have to project the physics aspects appearing in terms of band structure. And there are many systems that have shown this. We are focusing on a specific uh, non cooling anti magnets, where essentially the spins are pointing either inward into the triangle or pointing outward in, out of the triangle, which is what gives them interest in non collinear and if my or a chiral and from response. Now, if you see here, this is a uh, taken example of a magnet 3 10 system, which is a <coughs> non cooling and different magnet. And it has hexagonal symmetry. So the reciprocal space in a brillouin zone, uh, it has a hexagonal structure. And these points here are the Y nodes, which are separated momentum. And the beauty about these systems is that because here it's a magnetic system, when you apply a field and field rotating magnetization of the spins, you can actually move the while nodes in momentum space. So this is one of the rare material systems or uh, current magnetic system where a real space effect like magnetization can affect the momentum space uh, position of certain exotic points in your uh, band structure. And uh, inducing chirality to them is, is what actually gives rise to uh, this full Hamiltonian which is observed in terms of this energy separation and inverse separation. So I'm not going details of it. This is, a, this is something I just want to highlight that this is a long term vision about what we want to do. Uh, so we have started with magnetic state platinum systems. Uh, this is again in our sputtering system and I just want to demonstrate that in the sputtering system that we have uh, work, uh, built ourselves, especially I think he has been very involved in terms of building this system also at the start of his PhD time. So we have very good control on the growth. These are really highly oriented m 3 uh, pd films. Two dimensional growth. You can see even the four-fold symmetry of these films showing that they are really like really epitaxially grown. Uh, and which is captured by this concept of reciprocal space map, where this spot here tells you the crystalline quality of the substrate, and you compare this with your film. So when they lie on the same Q axis in this case, which is specific for 0, 0, 2 plane, it tells you that epitaxy constraint is retained. If you don't have epitaxy, typically this will be offset. They will not align in the same QX axis. <coughs> so <coughs> anyway, so this is something, uh, it's a good thing, and we have lots of experimental data, which I'm not giving here, but it, it, it has lots of interesting uh, results in terms of uh, uh, what we're trying to do to be able to show the wire symmetry response in these systems. So yes, and the other projects where we're trying to, you know, so this is a typical spin texture talking. This is a Skirmion texture, where if you integrate the spins over the full thing, it will essentially form uh, a full sphere, four pi. Okay. Uh, so this is, it will have specific topology <coughs> charge one or minus one depending on spin direction. And uh, interfacing there with superconductors is again there are a couple of theoretical works, but this is a long-term vision uh, that we're planning to, and definitely TFR has its own graduate program and. Uh, so we are also looking for uh, students uh, who are interested uh, in, uh, in doing PhD TFR and looking at these kinds of problems in the future. Okay, last thing about our in-house technology development. So, so many other things, uh, as as you see, you know, the, the system that we have, typically if anything fails, if something breaks down, uh, if you have a commercial system, you typically it will take a while to get it fixed, and this is a problem for any research programs, uh, and especially for us. So therefore, while we started, we in parallel have been working to make this technology development in-house. So we have a nice workshop. So I'm in charge of it. We have a lab manager, Atif, who's into, uh, into designing these things that we work together with. And then we have one person, Rakesh, who is all in all expert. He does brazing, welding, machining, uh, and vacuum components, all those assemblies that we have that we have seen here. Like this is actual setup that we have built, a manipulator, which is used in an MB to be able to really grow these high quality films. Uh, so this is, again, uh, and this is lastly a cryogenic filter asset that we have assembled. We are, this is the actual photograph of what we have. Everything is kind of made by ourselves, except few components, the VTA part we have to import, but this is now we are, again, making it ourselves. So this is something I've submitted to IHUB as a part of this technology development program. Hopefully it gets funded. But, uh, so this is something helps us to be able to uh, 
uh, look at uh, uh, more projects. So with this, I think I'm done, and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. It's indicating, I would say, unconventional spin textures, which is, so, so if I go into a little bit more detail, so generally whenever you have a gap of hysteresis, why does hysteresis happen? Because if it is a conventional spin which is cantered, when you apply feel, it will just rotate, rotate, rotate and come back and then you go backwards, scan, it will again come back and it would not show any hysteresis. But whenever there is an activation energy or some energy required to overcome a specific magnetic texture, there is an entropy, there is an uh, thermodynamic factor involved to be able to overcome the barrier. And that is what is typical signatures of spin textures. Skirmion is one of, one of them, but there are many spin textures that is existing. Uh, in plane spin textures, conical spin textures, mirons, and skirmions, skirmions, combination of both, which is observed, not observed, theoretically proposed in plane magnetization materials, this is what is one possibility. All these things, therefore, we label them as unconventional spin textures, which have a topological physics associated to the very phase contribution coming out of them. Yeah. <coughs> That's why we feel, in this case, it seems like we are getting some spin canting, but there is no evidence in this in this film. So as long as whatever samples you have made, we don't see this. So therefore, we think it seems to be a trivial spin canting. The interpersonal DMI is not strong enough uh, to be able to observe. But in this sample, uh, two, three samples, I would again say 10 samples, two, three samples show, which are high mobility, they show it. When mobility goes down, they don't, we don't observe this. So, it's, so therefore, we have strong feeling that high mobility means that you are probing the surface more clearly than the bulk, because major current flows to the surface. And this looks very much like the standard topological all signature. Yes. Sir. So if you just assume that your center of your field is shifted here for some reason, so <coughs> essentially what is happening here, uh, so here the zero is here, you have a king here, a dip here. In this case, if you just assume that your zero is shifted here around the switching, around the switch, then it is exactly the same. So in terms of models, we have tried many things, but when you have to explain in a paper or try to, you have to be more clear. So therefore we have hold on to this data and yeah, this is something, we will take a while. But for example, we, we are getting this square as mentioned in the crash limiter. So I've bought a two moment. So it has two squids. So it can simultaneously measure in plane and out of plane. So this will help us understand better with feel how does the two moment contributions come and how they play. So this will be direct evidence of unconventional spin textures experimentally. What is the typical size of this micron system? <coughs> uh, typical size of the structure? Yeah. 100, 150 microns, which by naked eye under a microscope. Can you sensitively local hall bar arrays on this? <coughs> uh, local hall bar, I mean, like nano squid, uh, if access is there, one can do it. This is something people have tried, but nano squid also it's an indirect method of extracting the moment. But uh, um, we're talking about these textures, even if they form typical lens. Yeah, typically these textures are around, depends, 20 to 30 nanometers, let's say, you can vary it from 100 nanometers, but even then, and then you're talking about making hall bar sensors of that range, and it gets tricky. And then lithography, multiple steps, and that is going to contaminate your, ideally, yes, you can probably stick something on, if you design something, stick onto it, and have a sensor, ideally, yes, like a millipede, you could actually do it, but it, yeah, it just, yeah, it requires more time. And, and these structures are anyway only at the interface, right? So yes. you'll have to pick it up yes. over the background over of the Over the background. So uh, that's the other thing. Generally, skirmion systems are observed in the bulk. And right. here we are saying, yeah, we, have we, we are seeing exactly only the, this texture is forming only at the interface. Yeah, only at the interface, not in the bulk. Okay, so. so what is that which could control the size of this? Suppose these are. Mm -hmm. so what is that which will control the size and typically is a field typically is because as you uh, uh, as you change the field from here to here your actual 
radius and radius keeps changing. I mean, they'll stabilize in the specific range, but if you want to generally have bigger range, then you have to play with the more interface engineering in terms of IDMI parameters, perhaps <coughs> put, I mean, uh, so we are slowly upgrading our TI because these things are good and people have studied extensively, but this is something, you know, started in China and US have been working on this almost a decade. And in India, we never had this chalcogenic MB grown techniques at all. So I started off under, knowing that we are starting from certain area where people have worked extensively, but this had to be done so that we can move step by step, like Bisman antimedial, right? So new MB that we have, we are now doing, working on Bisman antimedial, right? The reason is, it's a compensated TI, where the bulk conduction is even lower. And the physics is dominated only by surface. There are but this had to be done to be able to move on to those steps and then doping with chromium uh, to induce magnetic insulators, magnetic corrosion insulators. And magnesium specimen tether is other thing that we are parallelly working on in UMB. Uh, this is again interesting layer structure which again has possibility to show. Uh, and this can be a test bed to, I mean, building block to look at more exotic physics in terms of proximity. So, even in this one, Go down in temperature, would you see the history? Oh, exactly. That was what I was trying to ask. Sorry. <laughs> no, this one. Uh, huh, I haven't shown the data, but it's uh, the control device in plane is just straight. It's just a little bit parabolic. So, uh, I mean, we have control device always tested. Uh, that is always tested. There, we don't see this step like response. Is that your question? No, no, no. no you can go down in temperature. temperature. So, this I can tell you, for example, Huh, this one. This one. Let's take it down. I, I wanted to understand what is happening. So we, so when Navla was there, uh, so Mandar, it, we had given one sample, but it was COVID time, so we could not give the sample. I mean, she could not go. So we sent a sample to measure. There, it actually increased a lot more. Oh. But is one data, and uh, there it was it was different locking technique. So even Mandar was confused whether there is a face matching there or not. So since I was not there and uh, okay. yeah, because so it's so it it locked yeah. more in bismuth selenide. No, bismuth selenide EUS. Huh? We're talking only bismuth selenide. Yes. Yeah. As yes. only yes. bismuth selenide. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Bismuth yes. selenide. Uh, people have excellent work and they have never seen it. Yes. <coughs> so that is because very clear. Because we don't see the step like response yeah. itself. Yeah. Because I thought you know the temperature you might be able to see. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Okay. But. Uh, Physically, or I mean, theoretically, why? I mean, I understand experimentally, but since we have not seen up to 1.5 Kelvin, in fact, we have gone to actually once uh, 800 milli Kelvin, and we didn't see it till then. Uh, basically, you know, between this much and this much I don't see any you know, reason why you see it here and you don't see it. Here. Yes, there are a couple of reasons that I can think of. For example, from the chemistry point of view, no, Europium, so bismuth selenide is always selenium terminated. Right, right. Okay. And Europium has the affinity for selenium over sulfur also. Okay. Whereas in this case, okay. the tellurium, European telluride is also antiferromagnetic. There's a different magnetic okay. yeah, ex electronic exchange, spin exchange. And that can also drive along with the IDMA. So it's, okay. yeah, so this is it's a tough question, even for DFT experts uh, who have worked on IDMA because it has 4F. You, right. you, so, but yeah, this is something, <coughs> I think. Uh, but how far do you have the data for, like, you know, PIP AC3, below 1.6? We have one data which is close to, I think, around uh, uh, 300 or 400 million in Mandas uh, lab. The one data, and uh, otherwise we don't have. So this is something on hold, but we are restarting with a new student, and it's basically, yeah, it had to do with squid and other things which we had to characterize simultaneously and uh, make sure that what we are seeing and compare with various other characteristics. I guess no. So, I would like to thank uh, Professor uh, Karthik Raman for such a wonderful information. And uh, for the purpose, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Srijit uh, to just come up and uh, honor him with a small gift from us. Thank you so much. Okay. So
thanks to everyone for having to come to our today. I'll be here tomorrow. Okay. Uh, thanks everyone for coming here. Late evening. Yeah, thank you for being here till the evening. It's 6.30.